If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week for... This is another joke, right? Nope. Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records. <sighs>welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the who, what, when, where, why, and how do I feel about classic albums in my collection. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as TikTok. Last week, this week, and next might just go down in history as the harshest vibe whiplash ever on Vinyl Monday. But hey, I kicked this season off with In Utero, The Wall, Transatlanticism and forever changes, so Vibe Whiplash is kinda my MO. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, to cover today, so let's just jump right into things. This week, we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Live Through This by Hole. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you wanna play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls where sometimes you get to pick what's on the series. Keep an eye out for one of those. I make announcements when I'm places that aren't here. You can find all of that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a repress. This was the European run from last year, and as B-roll Abby should be showing you right about now, it's on this pretty pink vinyl. And it looks great on my white slip mat. I snagged my copy on Discogs. Thank you to the American sellers who take one for the team and import this stuff so we don't have to pay what the record costs in shipping. So let's talk about this cover art. No, this is not a photo from a 70s beauty pageant. This is a photo by Ellen. Ellen Von Unworth of Leilani Bishop, styled in this very 70s Farrah Fawcett hairdo. Courtney really said it all about what she wanted Ellen and the design team to accomplish with this shot. I wanted to capture the look on a woman's face as she's being crowned, this sort of ecstatic blue eyeliner running kind of- I won! <laughs> I have hemorrhoid cream under my eyes and adhesive tape on my butt. And I had to scratch and claw and fuck my way to the top, but I am, I am, I one Miss Congeniality. But here's the follow-up quote that the Wikipedia page leaves out. It's essential to interpreting this cover. Quote, that's the essence of the sickness in this culture I wanted to capture. On the back cover, we have this shot of tomboyish little Courtney photographed by her stepdad, Frank. So there's this fantastic juxtaposition between womanhood and girlhood before you start performing versus the performance. On Live Through This, we have the lovely, darling, pinnacle of virtue and grace, Courtney Love, on vocals, guitar, and she is joined by her songwriting partner and guitarist Eric Erlinson, Kristen Pfaff on bass, piano, and backing vocals, and Patty Schemmel on drums. Our special guests are backing vocalists Dana Kletter and Kurt Cobain, we really are just jumping right into the lore of this episode, aren't we? Live Through This was co-produced and engineered by Paul Caldery and Sean Slade, mixed by Scott Litt. Roll transition. Before I go any further, this could potentially be a tough episode for some of you. If topics such as uh, sexual assault, suicide, or death in general, if that's a little too much for you right now, that is okay. You can click out of this video and join me next week. The 60 second version should be free of those topics as well if you still want to keep up but can't handle this full episode right now. If that's the case, I totally understand and I will see you next week. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly where to begin today's story. Hole's history is almost as swirling and 
chaotic as the upbringing and life of the front woman. I guess we'll just drop in on the most obvious in point, Yonic Sooth, I mean Sonic Youth. <laughs> in the summer of 1990, a little Washington-based group called Nirvana served as supporting act for Sonic Youth, touring their most commercially successful release, Goo. <laughs> This tour no doubt bolstered Nirvana on their slow but steady two-year rise to becoming the biggest rock group in the world. That place, oh god, Nirvana baby, please don't sue me, firmly cemented by Nevermind. Just a week before Nevermind, Hole released their debut album, Pretty on the Inside, produced by Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth. Whole front woman Courtney Love meets Nirvana front man Kurt Cobain backstage at a Sonic Youth gig, and she makes no secret of her big fat crush on him. That's the thing about Live Through This. The circumstances of this album were born from Kurt and Courtney's relationship, just like you can't talk about in utero without talking about Courtney, you can't talk about Live Through This without talking about Kurt. It's a lot harder to understand whatever Kurt saw in Courtney, but we already broke that down in the In Utero episode. Let's break down what she saw in him. Here was this soft-spoken guy, a sensitive but chaotic creative, who accepted her for who she was. He didn't try to change her, and he saw her as his equal. In her words, quote, it's cool to go out with someone that you know would go out with you if you were a waitress and they worked at a gas station. You can get really paranoid in music because you never know why people like you. Of course, they were both in music. Seeing Nirvana's success lit a fire under Court's ass. She knew she was her partner's equal and wanted to prove that. Things were not all sunshine and roses. This relationship was troubled from day one. Court had a history with substances stemming from her childhood when she she met Kurt, she was clean, and he was not. As much as they adored each other, they brought out the worst in each other, spiraling headlong into heroin addiction. Then Courtney discovers she's pregnant. She immediately stops using. Remember this for later. Meanwhile, Courtney and whole guitarist Eric Erlinson want to take the band's music in a poppier direction. They negotiated a record deal with Sonic Youth and Nirvana's current label, Geffen. And a big one for a whopping eight albums. That is unheard of. Major label money means major label resources. Now Hole can deliver this new direction to the masses, but the rhythm section wants to stick with the noise rock thing. Creative differences and the general difficulties of working with a personality like Courtney loves I have no doubt caused Jill Emery and Carolyn Rue to quit the band. At a Janitor Joe gig in California, Court and Eric are captivated by the undeniable presence of bassist Kristen Pfaff. They try to poach her for whole, she says no, but her dad tells her that from a monetary standpoint, it's an offer she can't refuse. And Kurt introduced Courtney to drummer Patty Schemmel. Kristen moves to Seattle to rehearse with Hole, and at first, this lineup is really working. According to Eric, Kristen was the force that brought the band to life. They start dating. And while Courtney is on maternity leave following the birth of her daughter, the band holes up in a cabin to rehearse, no pun intended. Court said, quote, There was just a great flow. Those rehearsals were a really great escape from all that shit. The only way to escape it was drugs and music. What was she escaping from? Well, Vanity Fair took what should have been a blissful time for the new parents and ruined it. The article implied Courtney got Kurt hooked on heroin. She did not. He was already using. And that Courtney was using throughout her pregnancy. She was not. There's been some pretty extreme things written about us, especially my wife, and she thinks everybody hates her now. This is being recorded, so why don't you give her a message and say, Courtney, we love you. One, two, three. Thanks.
These rumors led to the couple losing custody of their daughter for the first nine months of her life. Kurt, in particular, got really paranoid. He started isolating himself from everyone, including his bandmates. All this put tremendous stress on Eric as well, who was friends with them both, serving as de facto band leader while Courtney was at a commission and trying to iron out this new lineup with Kristen and Patty. Meanwhile, Kristen has started using and Patty has developed a serious drinking problem. Basically, what I need you to understand is everyone surrounding this band is in the trenches right now. All of this shit colored the writing of what would become live through this. The music is influenced by everything from The Breeders to Fleetwood Mac to post-punk and new wave like Echo and the Bunnymen and Joy Division and, of course, every 90s alt-rocker's favorite band, The Pixies. With recurring themes like beauty, heartbreak, addiction, self-hatred, womanhood, motherhood, the Madonna whore complex, domesticity, pregnancy, and, of course, the nuances of being Mrs. Kurt Cobain. While, yes, the couple were involved in each other's songwriting, the lingering rumors that Kurt Ghost wrote live through this are entirely baseless. He did write old age, yes, but generally, Court didn't want or allow him to edit her work. Conversely, Kurt invited her in on the writing process for what would become In Utero. The record is even named after a poem she wrote. While she didn't write or co-write anything, Courtney is absolutely the muse of In Utero. Writing for what would become Live Through This started as early as the Pretty on the Inside tour. Violet was either written in the green room of the Jabberjaw in LA or in the van outside St. Andrew's Hall in Detroit. Detroit, it depends on who you ask. And sometimes both of those people are Courtney. She's not very good with dates, times, or places. Whatever the details, it was definitely the first live through this song put to tape in the form of Hole's John Peel session. Softer Softest was written on tour as well. Doll Parts was written in 91 in the throes of Courtney's crush on Kurt. According to her, she wrote it in a bathroom in Cambridge, Massachusetts. When I learned this, I couldn't help but think of how Heart Shaped Box was maybe written in a bathtub. I feel like all of you people in this room know that Courtney Love, the lead singer of the sensational pop group Hole, is the best fuck in the world. Miss World was written when the band moved to Seattle post-rhythm section changeover in mid-92. This was demoed at Rock and Rio along with She Walks On Me. Live Through This was recorded at a location we've mentioned once before on this series, Triclops Studio in Marietta, Georgia. Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins referred Courtney and company to this studio after the Pumpkins cut Siamese Dream there. I could write a whole video just on Courtney and Billy's decades-long on-again, off-again relationship. All you really need to know, though, is they dated around the Gish album cycle, they broke up, she hexed him, he lost all his hair. <laughs> Equally funny, Hole snagged Paul Caldery and Sean Slade to produce because Butch Vig wouldn't return Courtney's car. <laughs> Butch was so emotionally exhausted after dealing with Billy's perfectionist ass that he was like, oh, fuck this. The Pablo Honey guys can deal with this broad. No one seems to agree how the live through this sessions went, but Courtney seems to be the only one who remembers having a good time. She was showing up hours late, getting into spats with Eric over lyrics. Eric and Kristen were on the rocks. Courtney and Kristen were having issues over her closeness to Kurt. Paul thought the record was going to be sh**, but Sean thought it was genius. Some days they'd just give up, send the band back to the hotel, and work by themselves. In Eric's words, quote, it was the 90s rumors. Kurt spearheaded the decision to whisk the album away for Scott Litt to mix. Scott mixed Heart Shaped Box, Penny Royalty, and All Apologies on In Utero. As for the album title, lots of sources credit this scene in Gone with the Wind. I'm going to live through this and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. But I just don't buy this. I think it's more a reference to surviving the traumas surrounding the making of this record. The track listing of Live Through This goes as follows. Stupid. Smarty. 
Opening up side one, we have Violet, followed by Miss World, then Plump, next Asking For It, then Jennifer's Body, and side one closes with Doll Parts. Opening up side two, we have a cover of Young Marble Giants' Credit in the Straight World, followed by Softer Softest, then She Walks On Me, next I Think That I Would Die, then Gutless, and the album closes with Rockstar, but put a big fat asterisk next to that because it's not really Rockstar. It was a super last minute decision to swap out Rockstar for Olympia, so last minute that the album art was already printed and this mistake remains on the track listing to this day. Live Through This was released April 12th, 1994, 30 years ago this week, and there was one terribly unfortunate event that coincided with its release. By 1994, Kurt and Courtney were having serious marital problems amidst mutual active addiction and Kurt's physical and mental health at an all-time low. In March, Kurt organized a trip to Rome in hopes of winning her back. He pulled out all the stops, bought champagne and roses. They were in Rome because Courtney loved Roman history. He even bought her a piece of the Colosseum. But it didn't work. And that night, Kurt attempted suicide for the first time. The rest of Nirvana's European tour was cancelled. Kurt returned to the States where Courtney staged an intervention. Then she checked herself into rehab. Kurt would go to treatment too, but he wouldn't stay there. He escaped. On April 5th, just a week before Live Through This was set to be released, Kurt attempted suicide a second time. He succeeded. Ugh, I know there will be conspiracy theorists populating this comment section. It it's par for the course. If you want my stance on that nonsense, go to the in utero video. Having to be on the promo circuit for a record made through such chaos to begin with, now in the immediate aftermath of the horrible, tragic death of your estranged husband and the father of your only child? I don't know about you, but that sounds like my own personal circle of hell. The media hounded this woman, camped outside her house, followed her everywhere she went, gave her no space or dignity in grieving. And so Courtney was put in an impossible position. Either she openly grieved and people branded her too emotional and crazy, or she put herself together enough for interviews and then she wasn't showing enough emotion. She was heartless. To this day, 30 years Years later, Kurt's death is still the dark cloud hanging over Live Through This, which in turn unfortunately overshadowed another tragedy. On June 16th, just before Hole was set to tour this record, Kristen Pfaff died of an overdose. I've also seen theories surrounding her death relating to her closeness to Kurt and issues she was having with a jealous Courtney. I don't buy into these either. The tour was delayed a couple months so her ex Eric and the rest of the band could grieve. Jennifer Finch of L7 served as temporary bassist until- That's Melissa, fucking last name is French. Off the, uh, off the wall in German. Stepped into a more permanent role. The tour and subsequent festival gigs were a disaster, no thanks to Courtney's belligerence. Getting arrested in Australia for acting a fool on the plane, fighting kids in the audience, allegedly punching Kathleen Hanna of Bikini Kill in the face face at Lollapalooza? And we can't forget the most famous incident of all. Also... Hi, Courtney. <laughs> That's Courtney, everybody's favorite. <laughs> come on up. <laughs> Should we let her come up? Yeah. No, don't, please. Come on, Courtney. Singles, Doll Parts, and Violet got videos along with Miss World. These in and of themselves are pieces of art to analyze. Doll Parts was made after Kurt's death and was directed by the same guy who did the Smells Like Teen Spirit video. It's littered with references to Kurt and completely recontextualizes the song. Some of you Zoomers in the audience, the very few of you, might have been tipped off by the title of track five. And yes, the cult classic Megan Fox movie Jen Jennifer's body is named after the song on this album. I thought you only murdered boys. 
I go both ways. And Violet's on the soundtrack. 30 years later, Live Through This is remembered as Hole's most critically acclaimed, most significant release, if not completely overshadowed by the antics of the front woman. Oh, God. The Courtney love of it all. No matter what I say or don't say about this album and the woman who wrote it, somebody is going to get mad. I also realize the horrible timing of the release date of this video. I feel weird about it too. As enamored as I was with grunge at 11, 12, 13 years old, I never really got into Hole. And thank God I didn't at that age, I would have been an insufferable little bitch. I was wary of Hole as a teen not because of Courtney, but because my early experiences with her work were colored by misogyny from the media, from the internet, even the adults around me. I was wary of covering Hole now because of Courtney. No death or addiction excuses racist sh**. I won't lie to you, live through this put me through the f***ing ringer. This is the most I've ever had to break up my listening for any episode. It's been a constant struggle between trying to consume the art, my acute understanding of some of its subject matter, my empathy for the awful things Courtney went through during and after this album's production, and trying to find where to set my empathy for a shitty person aside. No one would be even remotely normal after going through a fraction of what she's been through, but at some point, in the words of Todd Chavez in Season 3, Episode 10 of BoJack Horseman, you are all the things that are wrong with you. Hmm, it's almost as if I have a history of enjoying fantastic art by trash people. Perturbed as I am by the way this woman chooses to conduct herself, you can't argue with live through this, it's really fucking good. Though as universal as the songs are, these are songs about being Courtney Love. You can separate this art from the artist, but you also can't. It's the live through this paradox. Now that we're done with all of that mess, on to the track by track breakdown. On my first listen throughs of Violet for this video, I thought, oh yeah, Butch Vig for sure produced this. It's got the polish, never mind, and Siamese dream had while still retaining the grit. I was so wrong. That polish and tenderness was absolutely thanks to Scott Litt. He mixed three of my favorite tracks from In Utero and worked magic on them. Violet is maybe the best example of the 90s soft, loud, soft, loud cliché. etc. Et on this record, I can see why this was chosen as a single. The contrast between delicate, pretty images like skies made of amethyst and stars like little fish contrasted with a childlike fit pitched in the chorus and bone-chilling wail of mine is forever. I'm reminded of the quote, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, or the idea that you should absolutely fear people who have nothing left to lose. Patty's symbol heavy rolls and this added guitar hum through the final chorus up the intensity to an almost manic state. All this makes Violet a heavy-hitting thesis statement. I miss world. So what makes this song so good is that A, it's catchy as hell, it's a prime showcase of Eric and Courtney's pop writing sensibility, and B, it's a uniquely female deconstruction of fame. It's specifically the acute realization that the price you pay is loss of autonomy and control over how you're perceived. On a much, much smaller scale, having my work make it to places I can't see, I've realized that no matter how hard I I try, I cannot control how I'm perceived. For me, I'll make my bed, I'll die, and it conjures up images of depressed housewives. Think of bed rot. It's worth noting this chorus was reworked from Janitor Joe's limited edition.
a song that f***ing rips. As far as music goes, that affected, sickly sounding acoustic guitar is so 90s. On to Plump. This song f***ing rips. If my tastes are any indication, I love a full tilt, kind of crunchy sounding assault on the ears. Kristen is just pummeling away at this thing on the bass. She had this unique blend of classically trained musicianship, she was a cellist, and raw power that gave Live Through This its edge. Hole can be tough for some to digest because, well, Courtney does not have a pretty voice by any means. She makes no effort to soften the blow. There are no pretty pink bows to wrap up on that ragged, grating, banshee screech. Dare I say, it's ugly. But when it works, it makes the whole song. I had a bodily reaction to the defiant snarl of, like a liar at a witch trial. This is Court basically saying, oh, you want an unfit mother? I'll give you an unfit mother, mother fucker. I throw the dirty dishes in the crib. But they weren't wrong. That apartment was gross. Part of Courtney's shtick was flinging herself into the audience to crowd surf like the guys do. She started doing this on Hole's tour with Mud Honey in 91. The crowd could do whatever they wanted, but she trusted them not to harm her. I think of Yoko Ono's cut piece or Marina Abramovich's Rhythm Zero. But sometimes this trust was betrayed. Courtney's clothes would be ripped off, and on at least one occasion, she was sexually assaulted. Asking for it is a confrontation of victim-blaming tendencies, just direct enough for people to get the message and just glossy enough for it to make it to radio. This is a powerful song, and I believe all of the above reasons were why this was chosen for the pseudo title track, with the line, live through this with me, I swear that I will die for you. Rounding out side one, we have the two best songs on the album. Jennifer's Body was my first whole song via the movie, of which I was an OG purveyor. Yes, it was weird to see it blow up with the young Jennifer's Body, the song, is about a girl who is tortured, killed, and dismembered. I'm not sure why, but since I first heard this song at 12 years old, I've gotten the vibe these images convey rape or incest. A metaphorical, visceral dismemberment of the personhood. However you interpret it, top to bottom, Jennifer's Body is menacing, straight up insidious. The riff creeps under your skin. Skin, and I won't soon forget the delivery of I'm your lover, I'm your friend, I'm pure and he hit me again. With a bullet, number one, kill the family, save the sun itself. It could turn milk sour. It could attract flies. This song makes me sick to my stomach, and this is usually where I have to take a break. Doll Parts is about obsessing over your object of affection, in Courtney's case, Kurt, and the struggle to share him, both with his audience and with other girls before they got together. I love him so much, it just turns to hate. As some Someone who suffers with retroactive jealousy in my relationships, Courtney was so real for this. I'm struck by the images of disassembled dolls. It represents a lack of identity, the willingness to completely deconstruct yourself in order to become something the object of your affection could love. Again, as someone with a history of losing my identity in interpersonal relationships, Courtney was so real for this. I want to be the girl with the most cake. She doesn't care if she eats so much she makes herself sick. What matters is she won the prize and she's gonna eat it in front of you just to spite you. This spite is an ugliness even the most confessional writers shy away from. Someday you will ache like I ache. I think of a woman speaking to a girl, the corrupted speaking to the innocent. Ache invokes longing, yearning, or a bruise that won't heal. This line puts the most amount of feeling in the least amount of words. Brilliant writing. A ballad is unusual for this band, but executed well, showcasing a new depth. But I prefer the gravelly, soft-sung approach on this song and wish it was retained the whole way through. 
I could have done without the obligatory shouting at the end. It kind of does the opposite of what it was supposed to do. The quiet part felt more cathartic. Kristen's backing vocals make this song. I really wish they were pushed up higher in the mix to make it more of a duet. She was a great contrast to Courtney. And while we're on it, her playing this whole record is flawless. No, literally. According to Sean Slade in the 33 and a third on this album, there are no bass overdubs on Live Through This. Kristen nailed everything on her first go around, which is a testament to the amazing feel she had. It is a tragedy we didn't get to see this style evolve wherever her career would have taken her, whole or not. Furthermore, Sean said the drum tracks have minimal editing. Patty shines on plump and credit in the straight world. With its almost gothic keys, I can absolutely hear the post-punk new wave influence on this one. It makes for a really interesting song structure, a brief excursion before returning to typical whole. Credit feels so believable, delivered by this personality in context with this record. That is what makes a fantastic cover. Before I read into the story of Softer Softest, I thought of that one girl in your second grade class. When you went to school with her, man was she weird. She was dirty, awkward, hanging out with her was social suicide. But looking back, wondering what became of her keeps you up at night because you realize she was just a kid and she didn't deserve to be ostracized over stuff she couldn't control. She was the girl who left her hand on the stove or pulled the wings off butterflies because she couldn't cope with what was going on at home. Then I found out I was spot on. But man, it has been viciously humbling to have pea girl gets the belt stuck in my head for a week. I've got a blister from touching everything I see is a rare vulnerable moment. It's the acute pain of being so desperate to engage with the world that you essentially rub yourself raw on it. She Walks On Me is a girlish diss to a frenemy, in this case, Kat Bjelland of Babes in Toyland. Interestingly enough, Kat is credited as co-writer of the very next song I think that I would it's the most straightforward punk track. The crunchy fidelity is a nice touch. Patty delivers this really punchy kick. It's fun, very high school. And then there's the spaced out bit with the overdriven wind up that honestly just made me want to go listen to Sonic Youth. Hey, when do I get to review Sonic Youth? Not until December. December? Aww. I Think That I Would Die is pretty obliquely about Kurt and Courtney losing custody of their daughter. It's similar to Jennifer's body in the sense that it's too close for comfort. These shrieks are too guttural. I feel like I'm hearing something I shouldn't. Gutless is the other straight cut track on the record. It kind of falls to the wayside alongside everything else we've heard, despite the thundering rhythm section, something's gotta be the weakest track. Olympia places Courtney alongside other female writers, specifically Riot Girl bands. Everyone's the same, reuse of the lines, we look the same, we talk the same from She Walks, we even fuck the same. In doing all this, it's a bikini kill diss track because Court really was picking fights with everyone. <laughs> she thought Riot Girl made female musicians look incompetent. In her eyes, it was doing the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. Hence the intro. Well, I went to school. Oh. Well, I went to school. <laughs> and the girlish ad-libs, which I like. It's a rare, unserious moment on this album and the much needed, relatively light spot to close this thing out. Courtney bids us goodbye in a very cheeky manner and that's Live Through This. What have I learned from Live Through This? a lot about this band, which I'd been hesitant to do a deep dive into, about Courtney Love, who I was honestly afraid to engage with, and a lot about myself as a music listener. This week included, I have only covered groups fronted by women seven times. Seven times in Vinyl Monday's almost three year history. For as much as I preach about how rock and roll wouldn't exist without women and young girls, I am ashamed of this. This album moved me because I find facets of myself in all the records you see behind me, no matter how insignificant. This 
invoked all of the facets I try really hard to ignore. Jealousy, self-hatred, self-destruction, uh, all the ugly parts of the female experience are here. I think that's what makes this special. It doesn't try to make itself perfect or pretty. It allows for a woman to be ugly, to be messy, rough around the edges, bad at things, complicated. Don't get me wrong, this was not the first album to do so by any means, but uh, whether by music or morbid fascination, Live Through This was the one that caught. Live Through This was a horrible, fucked up, self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a record about sacrificing everything to get what you want, like this pageant queen did, and in turn, each of Hole's members paid a steep price for this thing. For us onlookers, it forces us to look in the mirror, and then at the world around us, to confront the good, the bad, and yes, the Courtney. I regret to inform you, 30 years later, Live Through This is fucking brilliant. My personal favorites on this one are Violet, Miss World, Plump, Jennifer's Body, Doll Parts, and Olympia. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That is Live Through This by Hole 30 years later. What do you think of this album? What do you think of Hole? What do you think of Courtney Love? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet has to say, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!